Well, welcome to this week's Gospel Reflection. My name's Sean and I'm God Squad's International President. And today we're looking at Mark's Gospel, chapter 8 and verses 22 to 26, where we find the healing of a blind man in a place called Bethsaida. Now, you know what it's like when your riding glasses get all fogged up on the inside and the rain drops are just smeared across the front and everything's a bit blurry you lose the detail of the traffic and the road ahead and it's pretty disorientating and sometimes it can become downright dangerous now today's story is about seeing clearly we're at the midpoint of mark's gospel and it's a pivotal place because up to this point jesus disciples just weren't getting a handle on who he really was the messiah they continued their journey to bethsaida a city that it were it was a city but it had the feel of a village and it was on the northeast shore of the sea of galilee but it was familiar ground and the home of peter andrew and philip so let's pick up on the story in the text uh, from mark 8 verses 22 to 26 as jesus and his disciples came to bethsaida and some people brought a blind man and begged jesus to touch him he took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village and when he'd spat on the man's eyes and put his hands on him jesus asked do you see anything he looked up and said i see people but they look like trees walking around and once more jesus put his hands on the man's eyes then his eyes were opened his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly and Jesus sent him home saying don't even go into the village so Jesus had had a reputation for healing people but he wasn't interested in making a public performance about it and what's interested in Jesus healing is there doesn't seem to be a set pattern there wasn't some magic formula that he always used each encounter was different and each encounter often had several layers to it as well now this was life-changing for this particular man and as we shall see it was also something significant for his disciples to understand so he led the man away from the crowds and what we see unfold is the only miracle in the gospels that's recorded in stages rather than all in one go jesus touches the man's eyes and he asks do you see anything essentially what has changed and the man's response well i see people but they look like trees walking and it's a bit like thinking being back on the bike with the misted up goggles i can see tail lights up ahead in the rain but they look more like a disco i can't really see what's happening properly in front of me i can see stuff but it doesn't make sense it was probably a man that had been able to see previously he knew what trees and people should look like but he was seeing that something resembled a mix of the two and jesus touched his eyes again now what do you see he said to the man and now he could see everything clearly and jesus instructed him stay away from the village kind of keep this to yourself for now but the story doesn't stop there this isn't just a story of a blind man getting miraculously healed in a stop-start kind of way. You see, just before this, in the boat journey across the lake, Jesus expressed some frustration towards his mates. The conversation included stuff like, do you still not understand? Are your hearts hardened to this? Do you have eyes that fail to see and ears that fail to hear? Despite all his disciples were seeing before their very eyes, they were still not fully seeing who Jesus really was. And following on from this story about the blind man getting his sight back, as their journey continues, Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say I am? Or another way, what do you think people see when they look at me? And they responded, well, some say John the Baptist, or maybe Elijah, or one of the other prophets. And, uh, you know, one of those godly blokes that are a part of our history and story. But then Jesus asked them, what about you? 
Who do you say I am? What do you see? Do you see me as trees walking, a good teacher, an old prophet, or something more? Is who I am clear enough for you to see yet? And Peter responds, he, well he says to Jesus, you are the Christ. Finally, Peter was beginning to see clearly. But it would only be at Jesus' crucifixion, his resurrection and, and ascension, I guess, that they would, like the man at Bethsaida, begin to see everything clearly. But at this midpoint in Mark's Gospels, the disciples seeing begins to make more sense. Just as the blind man's healing was a process, the journey of the disciples seeing was also a process. And I think that's true for many of us. I also think it's true that for many of us, we stop looking when we think we've seen enough. We can end up becoming content with seeing people as trees walking. We can become content with seeing enough of Jesus that makes us feel good, but not so much of the Jesus that might challenge how we live. Now, if I'd become content with seeing life on the road ahead, always through misted up and rain spattered goggles, I'd have missed out on a more beautiful life on the road. So maybe Jesus still says to those of us who would follow him, what do you see? Who do you say I am? A prophet, a wise man, a good teacher, some kind of wizard, a revolutionary, an old mystic hippie, or someone more. If you're looking at Jesus, at the communities of people that choose to follow him, or at the scriptures written about him, and it just somehow isn't making sense, can I encourage you just to keep looking? Maybe we've seen something to start us looking, then keep going. Consider me to be one of those friends of the blind man that wants to take you to Jesus to help you see clearly. And as these stories in the scriptures unfold, as the disciples kept company with Jesus, as the church community followed in the power of the Holy Spirit, and indeed as the Hebrew people had previously walked with God in the Old Testament, they saw their place in God's story. They saw their true value and true worth in the sight of God. To see the world through the lens of Christ is to see clearly no longer seeing people as trees walking or life through misted up glasses smeared with rain. It is to see in a way that makes sense of the world that we live in. Cheers. God bless you. Now this week we have something extra to listen to and if it doesn't follow directly on from this video you'll see a link in the description or comments below. It's a recording that was made back in 2002 with our club's first international president and founder of the Melbourne chapter, John Smith. And he's speaking in the public bar of a city centre pub here in Swansea, where I'm speaking to you from. It was a remarkable night with a very diverse audience of around 150 people sharing food and drinks and each other's company. Bikers, musicians, artists, believers, seekers and cynics among them. But for a few moments, the pool table, the pinball machine, the bar fell silent as John shared his reflections on the story of the blind man who Jesus healed at Bethsaida. Please welcome back to the stage, John Smith. <laughs> Folks, um, you know, for a lot of you probably... Uh, Pub is hardly a place to have long spruks. Use the old Aussie term. I don't know whether you use that in the UK when people talk to you. And uh, I don't want to step over whatever the tradition here is. But I want to tell you two stories. And one of them is a story from the old book uh, that has had a big impact on my life. I don't have much trouble believing the stories in the old book. And I'll tell you why. And that is because in real life... I've seen so many things happen that are like you see 
when you read the old stories of Jesus. So I, I'm not sort of strung out about that. I, I know there's critics that say you can't believe in miracles and so on. And uh, I haven't got time to go into it here tonight, but uh, I was in two years in hospital with uh, rheumatic fever. The doctors, when I was a kid, thought I had, well, one doctor thought I had growing pains and they did nothing about it for six months. So by the time they diagnosed me as having rheumatic fever, uh, I was in deep trouble. And uh, I ended up in a coma with not only very severe rheumatic fever, but also with an accompanying disease called Korea, or I think it's, is it called Huntington's disease, is it? I'm not sure, but it was Korea or St. Vitus Dance. And uh, it's kind of funny now because I'm a, you know, professional talker, I suppose, but when I got that, I, I could not turn the pages of a book. I couldn't uh, feed myself. I couldn't articulate words because it just, it's like, it's like a spastic condition except that with a spastic condition, when you go to move, it goes wrong. With this disease, when the same virus that gives you rheumatic fever hits the central nervous system in the brain, it means that you don't want to do something and you can't stop yourself from doing it. So you sort of, you know. And uh, when I came out of that, uh, for some years I battled at high school with some nervous tics that made me look like an idiot. You know, I used to do this all the time. They couldn't stop it, you know. It was, it was really scary when you're at high school and kids really get into you and I fought that and then I used to sniff <laughs> all the time, you know, real loud. And you can imagine what that does to your sort of social life when you're an adolescent. But uh, I was in a coma and the doctors told my parents not to bother to even visit me because they had to go about 100 miles to come visit me in hospital, in the children's hospital in Melbourne and they were living up country. And they said, we'll tell you, it's not a matter of whether, it's a matter of when. He probably won't live much longer. And uh, my old man, like I said before, he meant a lot to me. And he's a real simple, well, he's not simple. He's a very complex mind, actually. He gave me Sir James Jean's book, The Mysterious Universe, to study Einsteinian relativity when I was 10 years of age. Now, he's a working class bloke, never been through high school. But he was like, I don't know whether you had this in Britain, but I know it was so, and in, in Wales and Scotland and Ireland, but I, in our country, in the old days, the old Labour Party people were self-taught and they taught themselves because they wanted to know. In one sense, they wanted to know what the bastards were doing to them. So, you know, an untutored, non-educated, uh, working-class bloke would read... Marx's Das Kapital to look at, at economic theory so that they could understand what the bosses were doing. It was really very interesting. And I grew up in that kind of working class thing where, you know, these guys had never been taught in university, but I tell you, they, some of them were very sharp in reading. And my dad got me reading heavy stuff when I was just a kid. By the time I was 10, I'd probably read all the major classics. I even read Martin Chuzzlewit and The Uncommercial Traveller, which two of the boringest books that that uh, the writer of uh, Tale of Two Cities and Oliver Twist wrote, uh, Dickens, and all that kind of stuff, and I grew up with that. But uh, when I... My dad believed when I was born that he felt, he and mum, that they got a voice from God. Now, you can laugh at that, you can do what you like with it. You know, it's the stuff that makes Mother Teresa's in this world. So you don't want to laugh too loud because some very incredible good things have happened out of people thinking they hear a good voice. And they felt that they got a message that I was going to end up being some kind of missionary. Well, they thought I'd end up in Africa or some, you know, the French equatorial Africa or something, but I didn't. I ended up working with my hippie brothers and sisters and in the bike scene and other subcultures. But it was still kind of, a, in a sense, a missionary thing going from the straight world to other worlds. And... Uh, but he, he was out digging spuds in the backyard and a good Celtic thing to do. And he, um, he just said to God, listen, you said that our son was going to do something useful with his life. And if, uh, if he dies, he can't. And, and, and I believe you're breaking your promise. So you better fix him up. And then he walked into mum and said to mum, John's going to be all right. And I gained consciousness and got better. I went to teacher's college and they wouldn't give me superannuation, they wouldn't give me any kind of insurance because my medical records were stuffed. You know, I had extensive what they call pericardiac damage to the heart, I had diseased valves in the heart 
and uh, they didn't reckon I'd ever reach adulthood. So by the time I got to teacher's college, I was supposed to be a walking dead man. It wasn't supposed to be there. So in the end, no local doctor could find it, and they sent me off to uh, a specialist, and he wired me up, did the cardiograph readings, and he said, Mr Smith, I don't understand your previous medical record. All I know is you've got a perfect heart, and as far as I can see, you could live to be 90 years of age. Well, I'm 60. I've really abused my body pretty hard over the years um, in many, many ways. Lived a life that's been crazy, you know, five hours sleep a night for most of my life, I suppose, and raced all over the place and had more accidents than you can poke a stick at in all sorts of ways, not only on motorcycles, and I'm still here. So you've got to understand, I mean, you know, humour me a bit, to, you know, but can you understand why it is I don't have trouble with miracle stories because I feel like I'm walking one, right? Now, I want to just tell you two stories there. That's not an apology for the fact I want to tell you a story from the Bible, but it's just to give you a background that I'll tell you this story because I believe it really happened. I don't believe you could have brought the Roman Empire, the brutal empire it was, down to its knees in a couple of hundred years unless something incredible happened back there in the Middle East. And I know the scholars running around trying to say it's all mythology and everything. I just don't think they've got their sociological brains in tune with social reality to try and dismiss that something happened 2,000 years ago, something that changed human history incredibly. And I know it's been screwed. I know there's people that have used Christianity to, to beat one another up and the Crusades went and bumped people off. I know all that. But I also know that the values that our society most value, like do the right thing to the other bloke, you know, do to others what you want them to do to you, all those values that we all talk about now are values that came to us from that kind of background. Now, here's the story. I want to tell you a modern story, a very short one, uh, about a, a, an ex-hippie friend of mine. And uh, I want to tell you a quick story from the old book. First, the story from the old book. It says that one day Jesus was walking along and a, a bloke who was blind... And unlike the tally evangelists who try to stick them up there and make a big sideshow of it, and I'm frankly not very impressed with that because Jesus often took people like this and he took them aside from the crowd because he didn't want to make some big show of them and make them look, you know, like geeks to, to make him look great. He took, took him aside to talk to him alone. And with this guy, he asked him what his problem was. The guy said he was blind and Jesus spat on a bit of dirt and took that and rubbed it in his eyes. Now, you know, I'm not going to talk all this stuff preachers normally will because we haven't got time. But it is kind of interesting. Just a bit of mud, mate, puts them on his eyes. And uh, he says to the guy after that, what can you see? And the guy says, well, yeah, I can see, but, but all I can see is people looking like trees walking. And then the Bible says that Jesus touched his eyes a second time and said to him, what about now? And the bloke said... I can see all things clearly. You know, one of the sad things is I think some people have encounters with God and they don't go all the way. And even although they've felt some encounter with the divine, they still see other human beings like trees. Now, it may be an adult that can't stand teenagers and their music. And instead of seeing their own kids as real human beings, they see them as a pest, right? Or it may be somebody who's been uh, sexually abused, so they... They see the people that represent that, maybe males as being like trees walking rather than like full human beings. And I really believe that what Jesus is on about is not giving you just a one-way ticket to heaven. I really don't like spending my time talking about the heaven-hell stuff. In fact, it's interesting, Jesus didn't really talk much about that at all. A lot of preachers do, but Jesus wasn't into that much. What he did talk about was reaching people wherever their need was and transforming their lives so they could really reach their potential, find relationships with God and with one another and be transformed. And I really believe that's what he's still on about. The man saw people differently once he'd had a divine encounter. And I tell you, that's what's happened to me. It really is. I mean, I, I can't think of any, any human being that I, I can't see potential in that couldn't make it, that couldn't be different. And I know that happened because of a personal encounter with the main man. But let me tell you a funny modern story. i got a friend that lives in Washington State, and when I went to do my research for the, this doctorate, I had to talk to all sorts of people involved in counterculture movements in the 1960s and 70s. I met this guy, he lectures for the military on loss because he says that everybody suffers loss in this life. You know, life is mostly about loss. You lose your hair, 
You lose your friends, they die. You lose your job, the boss gives you the flick. I mean, life's full of loss. And he said what Jesus was about was helping people face loss and know how to walk in faith and hope in the midst of a life that's full of loss. And uh, anyway, he told me his story. He says, this is what happened. He said, in 1967, they had a big thing in, in San Francisco and all the hippies were going there and the mayor of San Francisco was a freak too and he invited everybody to come to a special sort of love-in festival in San Francisco. And they had this big 60-foot tall thing of um, Francis of Assisi and then they had, you know, the, the Egyptian sun god and everything. It was just a real sort of mass of everything, any kind of spirituality you wanted. And they stuck this stuff together and they called everyone to come to sort of, uh, you know, get all the vibrations going so they could beat the politicians, collapse the army and make the world a peaceful place. And a lot of them believed it. I mean, it sounds crazy, but blokes with masters and PhDs degrees in those days got around the Pentagon and joined hands and thought they were going to levitate it. I mean, that, it was crazy in there. I'm old enough to remember those days and people really believed that. I mean, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, you won't even know who they are if you're here, but they were a great music group. And they sang a song called Chicago because they called all the hippies and, the, and all the, the kind of um, radicals, political radical young people, all to go to the Chicago Convention for the Democratic Party and to go there and kind of really influence it. And the song said, you know, won't you come with us to Chicago? And it said, we can change the world, rearrange the world. And I remember those days. I really felt we could. I felt we could do it. But then when, when you know, those kids got shot on Kent State University and then some others got shot on two other universities, and a lot of us as hippies said, our parents will shoot us before they let us change the system. And it was scary. I mean, that was, it was incredible days in those days. It's, it's hard to emotionally pass on to those of you that are younger what happened in those counterculture days. But anyway, this bloke said that a lot of his mates still thought they were going to change it, but he said, by 1967, I knew it was over. I knew the hippie dream was not going to work. And he said, I began to feel miserable. He said, I was the tribal elder of a group called the Rainbow Tribe. And he said, we used to walk around the country and, you know, pick a few bits of fruit and get a bit of money, but grow our dope, smoke dope, do music, live communally together and just wander around the country. And he said, here I am, he said, this day feeling miserable because he said, what started off as let's love one another and let's share one another's bodies and, and have real open love he said, many of us really believe we could do that and get rid of jealousy and just share one another and live like in the commune and, and whoever you felt like doing it, we'd do it and stuff. And he said, we thought this was going to work. And then he said, predators started moving in and using up the women. And he said, I knew it wasn't going to work. And then he said, we thought that the dope was going to give us, we were going to find God through smoking dope and it, it didn't happen. And then some of our mates had bad acid trips and so on. And he said, I was feeling miserable. So I went and sat. Now remember, this guy's a professor of sociology. He lectures for the military and he lectures at Washington State University. He's no, he's no donkey, mate. He's got his act together intellectually. But this is what he said. I sat out there in this paddock and I felt miserable, didn't know what to do. And he said, while I'm sitting there, a Jesus freak came and sat down next to me. He said, you've got to understand, I had nothing to do with the church. I hated the church because I thought the church was like politics, like the military, like everything else. I didn't believe any of it. I thought they were all screwed. So he said, I had no time for the church, but I thought a hippie, Jesus was a bit like a hippie, you know, so I could sort of you know, a little bit buy him a bit. But this guy came alongside me and he said, hey, can I talk to you about Jesus? He said, I said to him, no, you can't. If Jesus wants to talk to me, he can front up and talk to me himself. And he said, the guy just disappeared. And then he said, I felt more miserable than ever. And he said, I reached in my pocket and here was a piece of paper that was a, an advertisement for a YMCA book sale, you know, 50 cents a book, come up to this hall and it's all full of second-hand books. So he said, I thought I'd just go there to kill time. And I went over there and he said, I looked in the room and he said, you've got to understand, um, I'm a professor of sociology, but this is what happened to me. He said, I looked across the room and there was a book on the other side of the room. He said, it was brown, plain cover. He said, nobody seems to know it was ever published, but he said, here it is. And he pulled it down off the shelf and showed it to me. 
He said, this was the book. And he said, I looked at it, and it was like it went at me. And I thought, I've got to read that book. And he said, I picked it up, opened up the first page, and it was the list of all the publication details. And it said the book was published in the year of my birth. Now, he said, I was a freaked out hippie, and I was probably high. But he said, when I saw it was the date of my birth, I said to myself, oh, this is an omen, man. I've got to read this. So he said, I flipped over the next page, and he said, it just said, the words of one Jesus of Nazareth. He said, no preacher's comments, no screwing around with the text, just the red letter verses out of the New Testament that were quotes from Jesus, nothing else, just the quotes of Jesus. He said, I flipped over the next page and he said, I saw it said this, that which is flesh is flesh and what is spirit is spirit. You must be born again. And he said, I looked at that and he said, of course, of course. There's a difference between the physical stuff and the stuff we kind of feel and know is beyond the physical world. He said, I knew that as a hippie. And I thought, of course. Now, I won't go into details because I've got to finish in a moment so I don't bore you. But, I, but he, the guy just, he said to me, he said, I've got to take my hat off now. He said, this is my professor's hat. Because he said, you will understand this, but a lot of people won't. So I'll take off my academic hat and put it down there. This is what happened, John. He said, within two hours, I was a raging Jesus freak. I met him. He said, I just met him. I was turned upside down. And he said, I lay on the bed, and he said this. He said, I don't even know how to tell you this, but it's what happened. He said, I lay there weeping as I felt the love of God just take a hold of me. And then he said, I felt a weight on the end of my bed, and he washed my feet. I don't know what you're going to do with that. But he sat with this man like I did. I believe him. I believe that happened. He said, then I thought, oh, all my cousins and aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters that are the Jesus freaks, they must be in the church. I must have made a mistake. So he, he said, all of us hippies, he said, within 24 hours, the whole commune had become Jesus freaks. And we all raced off to go to church thinking we'd find all our lost spiritual relatives. And we turned up and we freaked them out so much with our long hair and everything else that the ministers fraternal met in town and they actually tried to find a way they could get us out of town and they even offered us money to leave. And he said, we just couldn't understand what was going on. He said, two ladies came up to me and they said, you know, we want to pray for you. And he said, oh, that's cool. No, they said, we want to exercise you. We want to throw the demons out of you. And I said, what are you talking about? They said, well, we know you're demon-possessed because you talk funny and you look funny and your music is funny and, and we've been trying to get people to find Jesus in this town for the last 30 years and no one has. And all of a sudden, all you freaks are running around with everybody saying they've become Jesus freaks, so you must have been possessed of the demon of mesmerisation. Isn't that crazy? I want to say to church people here tonight, do you wonder? Do you wonder? Do you wonder that most people don't want to go to church and don't want to know about it? I mean, it's bizarre. In fact, I saw a T-shirt the other day, and I'm not going to go back on what I said before. I still think we've got to battle this through and find one another, and we do need some form of church. But I tell you, I saw a T-shirt, and it said, God, please deliver me from your friends. <laughs> you know? And I can feel for me mates about that sometimes, because sometimes Christians are so stupid, you know. But God still loves them, and he still loves you. And I tell you, I could tell stories like that, hundreds of stories like that. I know of a guy who was going to commit suicide. He's a friend of mine now. He went up into the, into the mountains and uh, he climbed right up this very steep mountain in the middle of the wilderness. No one around. He got up on the top of this mountain peak with very little space to sit on with a massive drop of thousands of feet. And he said, he was an atheist, he said, I can't live without life meaning something. My God, if you're there, you'd better show me or else I'm going to jump. If you don't do something, and a long-haired Jesus freak came straight up in the middle of the wilderness just next to him as he prayed that prayer and said, are you the fellow God Jesus has sent me to talk to? I mean, it'd be pretty hard not to get converted, wouldn't it, if that happened to you, right? I just want to say to you tonight, folks, thanks for being patient. I don't want to sound kooky and weird. But I tell you, people believe some pretty crazy stuff and I find the main man more believable than anybody else in human history. I really do that. I find that intellectually. I've done doctoral courses on Hinduism and Buddhism, Islam, Judaism, mystery religions. 
just finished all that stuff and I found some beautiful things and some wonderful things in other religions. But for me, the main man is the man that died for you and died for me. And I'm, I'm wrapped about that. And like if you, like a, you've had it loaded on you from me here. I mean, if I go sit down there having a Guinness with you, you know full well, those of you that know me for a while, I'm not going to come and put it in your face unless you want to talk to me about it. I've been asked to do a job here. I feel nervous about it because I know some of you don't like the church bit. I don't want to get you offside. I just want to be a friend. But I tell you, I want to ask this one thing. If ever you have a doubt about where you're going, you might be satisfied now, but if you're ever in a spot where you really feel the wheels have fallen off, get the old book and read the story of Jesus. Have a look at him. There's nothing else like it in all of human history. To me, he's the main man, and he's the one that loves you and me, and he's the one that wants us to see one another, not as trees walking, but as wonderful, incredibly potential human beings that have the very heart of God beating for us, that we might get there and get our act together and we might find what we were created to fulfil and know who we are and why we're here. God bless you and thank you for listening.